before we start the seminar, before we kick things off, um, when I'm going to teach people how to lift and how to eat and all these different things that we're going to go over today, I like to teach people how to live. And that's what I'm really excited and really passionate about sharing with you guys today. It's not trying to change your lives. It's trying to enlighten your lives because I've had a lot of life experience. And I don't really like that word, uh, change someone's life, because after all, it is your life. And for me to try to overly influence you is a mistake. But for me to give you guidance and tell you some cool things that have come my way from the hard work and from the different things that I've experienced is the only way I really know how to lead you to the right thing. Well, I like to always show people, and uh, this is from Coach John Wooden. There's a couple things from Coach John Wooden that I'll probably reference today because he's the greatest coach in the history of coaching, winning over 10 national championships with UCLA basketball. But he taught his athletes how they should cut their hair, what clothes they should wear. He had a, an idea of every single thing that they should do, and they should all be uniform. They all had the same goal. They all wanted to win. They all wanted to be better. And it came down to every single detail that you can possibly think of, all the way down to how they tie their shoes. He would even teach them how they tied their shoes. Well, why would he go through all that trouble and, all the, and go through all of that to show them how to tie their shoes? Well, he wanted each one of them to go through a similar thing. He wanted each one of them to experience what that was like. They all shaved their head. They all had a crew cut. They all were uniform. They all were the same. They were all part of a team that was part of something bigger than themselves. And that's what I encourage you guys to try to find in your life. The people that work here at Slingshot, including myself, we are all part of something bigger. It's not just a company that's trying to make money, although that is the goal, let's face it, right? It's a company that's trying to inspire people. It's a company that's trying to lower the level of entry into fitness because it's hard. Trying to lower the level of entry into diet and nutrition. Because there's so many good, yummy foods out there that it gets to be really hard to stick to anything. Before we kick this, this uh, seminar off, I've done a lot of seminars where they start like this. I'd like to show you how a power lifter should put on and take off their shoes. I just got an idea of how to take them off. I'm going to show you how to put them on, if I can balance correctly. Whoop. Look at that. Get those fat little feet in there. Wham. And last but not least, this is how a power lifter should tie their shoe. Ready? And I'm done. Just going to leave it there. Don't want to risk anything. Don't want to pull a hamstring. Don't want to hurt my back or anything like that. And I uh, don't want to break out into a sweat and turn red and purple in front of all you guys. Really excited to have you guys here today, and we got a lot more people uh, kind of filtering in. But I like to reward the people that got here early. I know that everyone tried to get here early, but some of you actually made it here early. And part of being early is actually just part of being on time. I learned that when I did professional wrestling. I was a professional wrestler for over five years. I ate a lot of shit sandwiches in my time without the bread, as I like to call it, trying to learn the ropes of professional wrestling. Um, having the realization that when I went to Ohio Valley Wrestling and I saw Shelton Benjamin jump up on the top rope and proceed to run around the entire ring and then do a backflip, land on his feet perfectly, and then do a drop kick to somebody... I recognized quickly that that wasn't going to be me. And even before that, getting involved in the life of somebody like John Cena. My brother Chris and I got John Cena into pro wrestling. My brother Mad Dog was his first coach. 
and I quickly realized I sized them up like we all do as men, sometimes at the urinal. <laughs> Can I get a hey now? Yeah. You size people up. That's, that's part of what we do, right? And that's part of what gives us so much damn anxiety every single day, right? I size him up, right? He's two years younger than me. I'm like, all right, strike one. He's better looking than me. Strike two. He's more jack than me. Strike three, game over, sit your ass down. Part of knowing who you are is knowing who you're not. I am not John Cena. You can't see me. You can see me. <laughs> I'm not Ed Cohn. And no matter how hard I tried in my powerlifting career, I would never be Ed Cohn. There's nothing I could do. You can't outmatch somebody's genetics, their own worth, work ethic, their own morals and values, and their own dedication towards something. When I tried my hardest and worked my hardest, my best deadlift was still nearly 200 pounds less than what Ed Cohn was able to do. And I think it's important for us to understand that sometimes, even when we work hard at something, we're still going to halfway suck at it. It's an important lesson to learn. I think we have a tendency to focus in on where we're strong and where our strengths are. And those things are great. Those things are important. And those are going to be the things that help you flourish. Those are the things that you can lean on in your time of need. The way I leaned on something like a slingshot, I've always been good at bench pressing and was able to come up with a great invention through many years of training and through many years of hurting myself. But where you're weak is going to be the things that you're going to have to explore the most. And people that are able to make real changes in their lives need to be applauded. When you see that and recognize that in somebody else, it's, it's not really just getting a 10-pound PR on a bench. It's making changes with your habits that you currently have into shifting into new habits that are healthier and stronger for you. And when we see somebody come off of drugs and alcohol, or we see somebody drop 20 pounds. We see someone who's heavy drop 50 pounds and never gain the weight back. That person deserves a goddamn hug and a round of applause. When you see stuff like that, have the courage, have the strength to acknowledge it. Don't let that stuff just go by. The greatest things that you'll ever experience in this world are free. That's why today's seminar is free. That's why Super Training Gym is free. That's why a smile is free. That's why a hug is free. That's why a pat on the back is free. And I know sometimes this can sound a little silly, but it is part of the equation. We're going to be negative. We're going to chew each other up here and there, spit each other out. We're going to be mean. We're going to be lewd. We're going to be rude. That's kind of part of it. We got some real nasty locker room talk that happens here at Super Training Gym. And we beat the ever-living shit out of each other uh, with words, with violence, and with lifting in here pretty much every day. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter your race. Doesn't matter your background. No one gives a flying fuck, excuse the language, about what, uh, what car you drive or how much money you got in the bank. Me too. When you're loading up a bar for a deadlift. Can you lift it or not? That's what we're looking to see. Can you pick the weight up or not? How, are you getting better? Or are you just doing the same old thing? Even if you're the strongest guy in the group, if you stay the same, that's the worst thing that you can do. The pain of trying to make a change is very difficult. And that's why it's important that we need other people in our lives to help us to be able to make these strong, powerful changes. There's a saying that says, if you walk with the lame, you will develop a limp. If you walk with the lame, you will develop a limp. And that's why 
I choose to do my 10-minute walks with guys like this over here. Ed Cohn, Stan the Rhino efforting. My wife's over there too, Andy Bell. Can I get a hey now? Woo! <laughs> and my BFF, my big fat friend, <laughs> Jesse Burdick. These guys are some real killers. But not just in the gym. They are like that in their lives. They have values. They have habits. They have strengths that I truly admire. One of the strongest people I ever met is Jesse Burdick. It's not always about the actual numbers that you hit. Jesse has hit some huge deadlifts. He's hit some huge squats. I've always killed him in the bench. He's hit some huge numbers on the platform, but I admire him as a friend. He's always there for me anytime I ever need him. Whether it's uh, just a quick lifting question or whether it's him reinforcing the fact that I need to work on my mobility or whether it's him reinforcing the fact I need to stop being so fat or whether it's him telling me I need to sleep more or I need to relax or whatever it is, he's there for all of that all the time. And Stan Efforting is not there for any of it. <laughs> because Stan is a self-centered son of a bitch oh to the core. And I don't know why I even invited him here. Because the second he grabs a hold of the microphone, all you guys are going to be asking is about the vertical diet. And I'm going to sneak off and uh, run with my tail between my legs. Me and Burdick will just go somewhere and maybe eat some I pizza. Hop, we'll see you there. Yeah. We're going to have some freaking pancakes. Eat some carbs. And Rudy Tooty fresh and fruity as I have. <laughs> but all these guys have been, been there for the entire journey. How we met, how we came to be. I'm going to have Stan Efferding come up here and explain a little bit more on how we all met. But when I started Power Magazine and I needed help, I didn't have any money. I had nothing. I had absolutely nothing going on. I was driving a shit van that I punched the steering wheel of one time because I was so frustrated those of you that have kids will understand. Those of you who don't have kids are going to think I'm a maniac right now. I punched the steering wheel because both kids were crying. The wife was away doing something. I don't remember. You know, I can't be left alone with the kids for more than 10 seconds or I have a heart attack. I don't know how she's able to figure it all out. Punch the steering wheel, and the horn proceeds to go off as I'm going down the freeway. Not only that... The horn goes off all the time. Periodically, with a little toot toot in there, I'd go through uh, Dutch Brothers or Starbucks to get some coffee, and the thing would be making these weird little beeping, squeaking noises, and I'd always look behind me and be like, oh my God, an asshole behind me keeps beeping at me. <laughs> Most embarrassing thing ever. But when I decided to, ha to start a magazine, Power Magazine, which is still around today, the only strength magazine in the freaking world, when I decided to start a, a magazine, I went to Stan. Stan was already doing well in business. I was not super freaking fat at the time. Stan influenced me in that way as well. He influenced me as an entrepreneur. And he said, hey, you know what? That magazine that you started, I think it's a cool idea. So I reached out to Ed Cohn. Didn't know Ed Cohn on a personal level at that time. Reached out to Ed Cohn. He thought I was a dick, but he wanted to be on the cover of a magazine. So he wrote me back. We had a great interview. We stuck him on the cover. Efforting fronted some of the money for the magazine, as well as getting his friend Flex Wheeler and their company to come in and advertise in the magazine. Stan paid for Ed Cohn to fly to the event, paid for his hotel, took care of everything. I think even helped us with the booth. Because he was already in with uh, some of the bodybuilding crowd. It was at, it was at and he knew some people that time, helped run the show. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The and so right there, right off the bat, I had a friend team. that was willing to help. It happened with the slingshot. It also happened with starting Super Training Gym. It happened at every turn. If you guys are open with your goals, you tell other <laughs> people about your goals, and you get around like-minded people that want to be a bunch of savages and that want to lay down some good strong habits and that want to become better each and every day all they care about is putting one foot in front of the other and helping you get one foot in front of the other you will get to where you want to go 
And when you're hoping and praying and crying each and every day, trying to figure out how to make ends meet, it'll happen for you. Trust me. Nothing is worse than trying to be good and ha not having shit happen for you. But you're going to have to eat some shit sandwiches without the bread for about 10 years. It's not part of the vertical diet. <clears throat> for about 10 years before you start to see the fruits of your labor. Guys, here's Stan the Rhino efforting. Oh. I have to go up there and talk on myself. Is this mic for me right here? Or I'm already mic. Look at that. Mic. Hope I wasn't talking shit over there, you guys here. <laughs> Listen was. to that Mark. Mark's never going to stop talking. So I really didn't have anything prepared today. I thought we were going to come squat, bench, and deadlift. I'm not sure what you guys expected. But uh, yeah, that'll happen. That'll happen next probably seen a lot of the stuff recently about the vertical diet, uh, all the podcasts and interviews and stuff on the internet, etc., etc. Uh, that's actually something that's been developing for probably the better part of 30 years. I've spent my entire life from the time I was in college uh, trying to utilize training and nutrition and uh, sleep uh, to become the best athlete I could be. And that meant getting as big and as strong as I could possibly get to power lift, and getting as shredded and uh, lean as I could to bodybuild. And I learned a lot along the way, and I had the opportunity to work with some great people. One of the key things to my success has been that I've always sought out as much knowledge as I possibly can, which is why it's so great to see all you here to listen to what I think are some great influencers in the industry, some great knowledge in the industry, people who I've sought out for years, for better than a decade. When I wanted to be good at something, I had to get as much information as I possibly could. When I was in the, in the 1980s, of course, we didn't have the internet. And so I was asking whoever I could that seemed to be more knowledgeable or bigger or stronger than me what kind of information they had, and I would try and utilize that to get better. Nowadays, uh, there's so much great information out there, it's almost hard to sift through it and find what works. But as much information as you can possibly get and then apply it is really what's been the secret for me, is I've been kind of a, like, I refer to myself as a blue-collar athlete. All my life, I've just plugged away. I've had checklists every single day, making sure I did my part. I wasn't a big dreamer in terms of someday. I was a today guy. And every opportunity that I had to work with somebody that was better than me, bigger than me, stronger than me, or could influence me some way to improve my performance, I took advantage of that. I went to seminars. I flew out and trained with Eddie Cohn. Obviously, I lived with Mark for two months and trained here. I went down to San Jose, and I spent three months living in a hotel there, training with Flex Wheeler. I've traveled damn near all over the world, overturning every stone I could possibly find for information. I've worked with probably every guru in the business, from Dave Palumbo to Charles Glass, again, Flex Wheeler, uh, Chris Aceto, uh, Hani, um, Oscar, who trained Kai for many years. I've worked with all of these people personally. And uh, Chad Nichols, who trained Flex, and uh, Ronnie Coleman. And I've gleaned, uh, I say, harvested information from all of these people, which is what you're doing today, and I hope you continue to do ongoing. And then I applied it. And that's one of the big things that, that is just learning as I went. And I took every single piece of information I could, and I tried it. And I gave it an honest try, not for a day or two, and not 50% or 70% of it, but all of it. And I tracked it very closely over the years, and I think I was able to formulate uh, something that worked for me. And then I started using that with my training partners and my clients. Uh, and now, of course, the culmination of that is you see more recently that I've had the opportunity to work with some of the greatest athletes in the world. And what I've been able to provide for them is really fundamentals. And that's what I keep hammering on uh, over and over and over again. And so I know it's getting boring to watch my podcasts because they're all the same thing now. Stan's going to tell us to sleep better. Stan's going to tell us to eat better. Uh, he's going to tell us to be more consistent. And that's really what it comes down to. So anything that you learn and implement consistently towards your goals is going to yield a positive result. And then you have to avoid the distractions. On my diet recently, I talked about things not to eat. And it really riled a whole bunch of people up. They got all upset because Stan told me not to eat this. Look, you can eat what you want to eat. And you can train the way you want to train. 
and you can sleep the way you want to sleep. It, it doesn't matter to me. That's on you. But if you're giving it an honest effort and you're looking at everything that you're doing and trying to figure out how to improve, uh, like Eddie Cohn says, is when uh, you improve everything, everything improves. And that's what I tried to do throughout my career was just find little things, not big things. Everybody's always chasing these, these major performance improvements. But if you can improve little things, a lot of little things, 10 little things, 12, 15, just a little bit, then everything will improve. So that's why I keep talking about the fundamentals and the basics, and that's why I finally put the vertical diet out, which is more than just the vertical diet. It's the vertical diet and peak performance. And it talks about more than just food. It talks about hydration. It talks about sleep. It talks about so many aspects to becoming successful. Uh, I talk about time management, the logistics, uh, just from having your meals. Everybody's seen me harp about making my monster mashes before I travel and using a thermos or freezing food and taking it all with me or landing somewhere and making sure I have everything I need. Uh, that's the biggest thing that I've done for my athletes, I think, is help them get organized, help them plan better, uh, help them eat foods that, that they can digest better so they're healthier. Um, you know, even with Hofthor, uh, it was more about working with his manager so that when he was flying places that he had the food he needed when he needed it. And even with Brian Shaw recently, you know, he's going to compete in the world's strongest man. And some of the biggest things I did was trying to coordinate where is he going to stay? Does it have a kitchen? Who's going to take care of his grocery shopping? So behind the scenes, uh, while you know, squat bench and deadlift is, is neat to, to do, it's not going to be as much fun if you haven't taken care of, of business, if you haven't meal prepped, if you haven't gotten yourself ready and gotten enough hours of sleep at night. So when I keep hammering on these fundamentals, and it sounds so boring, uh, everybody should have a plan in place. They should have a checklist. They should be trying to get more sleep. They should be trying to eat better. They should be trying to meal prep and coordinate that better. Uh, even today, how many people, you know, we're going to be here for five hours probably from the time you showed up to the time you leave. There should be a meal or two in there. How many people brought a meal or two? I see a few hands here. That's great. I brought five. <laughs> I'm gonna, and if you, if you miss me somewhere you're looking around and I'm not here, I'm in the kitchen cooking my next Monster Mash. And that's some of the things that I'd like you to, to do because it's not really about the training necessarily. That's just a stimulus. That's all that is. And I, I, I don't even like talking about training very much in my seminars because you don't grow in the gym. All the growth happens eating and sleeping. And if that's not on point, then the gym is going to be a very exhausting place for you. Uh, I had to break through tons of barriers from being 140 pounds when I started. It took me over 10 years to get up to 300 pounds. And it wasn't pretty. That was a dirty bulk. And then to learn those lessons, and then all these many years later, now 32 years later since I started competing, I still use the same techniques that, that I've used my whole career to be organized. I don't even compete, and I still have a checklist every single day of things, these little things that I have to do. And if it includes eating a daily carrot or eating an orange or taking 10-minute walks, uh, the list goes on and on and on. Uh, how many hours did I sleep? I keep track of that because I know that if I have a poor performance, that I can look at that list and see, oh, there it is. There's some couple of five-hour sleep nights I sacrificed uh, for some other uh, what I considered to be important thing at the time, and it, it hindered, it hurt my performance overall. So uh, that same thing is true in business. If anybody heard my rant about stress for success, if you want to be successful, uh, sacrificing sleep is not the way to go. Sacrificing regular exercise is not the way to go. Compromising your nutrition and hitting the fast food place, that's not the way to go. All of those things will hurt your performance in business just as much as they'll hurt your performance in sports. So. Those are the big things that I'd like to get across before we uh, start getting into the actual lifting. I think those things are more important. I won't belabor the point and bore you anymore, uh, but uh, those are the things I'd like you to take away today. Are you uh, looking at a clock all day, every day, to be able to fit all these things in that you're doing? I, I do schedule myself pretty tightly, but I also prioritize the things that are most important. Uh, one of the things I talked about in Mark's uh, podcast recently is that uh, I try to be very efficient, and a lot of people will will do a lot of things in a day, but maybe not the most important things. So I do have action items, priorities, and I put those in, and those become the first thing I do, possibly first thing in the morning. But more importantly, with respect to all the other things that happen, and, you know, I get over 100 DMs and emails a day, and I, I want to respond to as many of those as I can, or all of them. 
uh, is to just very quickly and very efficiently and very focused get through your list so that you have the time and ability to continue to grow yourself as an athlete or as a, as a business person. Let's get my fat little buddy up here, Jesse Burdick. I specifically asked not to follow Stan, so that's why I'm following Stan today. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Mark. I appreciate that. <coughs> um, just like Stan, I didn't have anything prepared to kind of uh, start with. Uh, we more plan to do some kind of squatting and deadlifting. But if we're talking um, just kind of life and just kind of advice and just, you know, how important it is to have good people around you. One of the biggest things that I've learned kind of going through things um, in not only my lifting career, but just in life in general, is to um, uh, properly manage your expectations on what's happening around you and what you kind of can accomplish and move forward. Everyone should have big goals and you should set those big goals, but those shouldn't be your only goals. And you should realize that there's small steps that are always gonna lead up to those goals. Um, don't concentrate on one big thing, concentrate on a lot of small things. Because once you start to accomplish those, accomplish those small things, you're gonna kind of turn around and really see the distance that you've moved. True progress is measured backwards. You look backwards and you look where you came from to where you are now. That's a big, big thing to remember. People really focus on one thing and they get stuck where they are and they get just bogged down about, I'm not where I want to be. But you got to look behind you and see where you've come from to where you are now. Um, you know, and it's kind of a kick in the dick to kind of really take a look at your life and kind of have to take a step back. Uh, for me, when um, I got custody of my two girls, being a single dad, uh, business owner, and uh, I found out very quickly that I wasn't going to be able to accomplish a lot of the things, specifically in lifting, that I wanted to do. Um, but priorities change. Life happens. And it's going to happen to everybody in here one way or the other. Um, it's much better to be prepared for it. Think about things in small increments, okay? Um, it took me a long time to kind of figure that out, but again, kind of to build on what Mark was talking about, having great people around you really kind of helps you out. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, was, I, always, I, I tell this story uh, kind of tongue in cheek, but also because of uh, how valuable of a life lesson this is, but also to show how much of a prick Mark is all the time. Um, when I was kind of going through a whole lot of stuff, one of the one of the biggest things, kind of one of the changes that I had to make was how I was looking at my situation. And I was sad, and I was mad, and I wasn't sleeping, and I was pissed off, and I wasn't able to do what I wanted to do. And I was kind of complaining to Mark, and Mark was being a good friend and listening to me and letting me kind of vent to him. And then he told me a story about when he was at a playground with his kids at the time. And uh, there's a guy with a special needs kid in a wheelchair and the dad picked up the kid and took him on every single thing on that playground. Took him down the slide, took him across the monkey bars, did everything possible to make that kid's experience at that playground better. He told me all about it. <clears throat> and he talked to the guy and he said, hey man, this is amazing, uh, how do you do this? And he said, what other choice do I have? This is, this is just everything that I'm going to do. This is my son. I want to make sure that he has the best experience possible in every situation possible. Undertone there was stop fucking complaining about your life. You have it really good. You have a job. You have a roof over your head. You got two girls that are great. You got a business that is growing. Are things where you want it to be? No. But can they get better? Yeah. Are they really that bad? No. So. Surrounding yourself with good people is really, really important. Surrounding yourself with really, really asshole, honest people is even more important. You gotta have somebody in your life to kick the fucking real deal to you and tell you your life ain't that bad. Things are gonna get better. You just gotta work at it. And if you don't have that person in your life, you need it. And I would challenge you to go find that person. And even sometimes, if it needs to be one of us, because I feel responsible because 
I was given a great friend who helped me out. When I get questions online and when people come up to me and start talking about stuff, even if I don't know you, I'm going to try and be as real as possible with you guys. And so will Mark and so will Stan and so will Ed. It's not because we're assholes or because we're just trying to be blunt or trying to show off. It's because maybe you don't have that person in your life yet. Don't stop looking for him, but you know, take advice as something to move forward with. And even if it is an inch at a time, it's still progress moving forward. So I encourage you guys to ask questions, reach out to people. I'm in the position that I'm in right now in front of you guys, strictly because I had the audacity to ask questions. I had the audacity to call Louis Simmons, Dave Tate, Jim Wendler, Mark Bell, Ed Cohen, Stan Efferding. And now these people are some of my best friends. I talk to them every week, oftentimes three, four, five times a day. Um, so, you know, about, nothing. about absolutely nothing. It's amazing. Our phone calls are, you know, some people are like, oh, man, to be a fly on the wall. Like, if, if to be a fly on the wall would be great because I don't even know what we talked about. Yeah, you wouldn't learn much. We usually call each other twice. We call each other and we talk for about 45 minutes, and we call each other back five minutes later to, tell, to go ahead and say, hey, all I wanted to tell you was, I'll be there on Sunday. What time do you want me to be there? Oh, here. And then that's it. But those are great friends. And if you don't have those people, search around for them. And if you look around at the group that you have who are surrounding you and they're holding you back, it's time to cut dead weight. You can't feel bad about that. It's time for you to move on. One step at a time. And if that means it's time to go ahead and get rid of that guy who's just partying, being drunk, and really not doing much for you, so be it. You'll actually do him a favor by moving on. Because eventually someone's going to have to kick him the real deal and tell him to fucking grow up. And if that has to be you, that's your choice, that's your, you know, that's your path in life, and you have to be that good friend and that person too. So ask questions, make sure that you kind of get anything and everything that you can, not only out of life, but out of today as well. That's what we're here for. This is what we love to do. So let us help you as much as possible. And here's Mark. The people that you train with should sometimes be the people that you want to kill. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's no different than training with these guys over here. I never really had the honor of training with Ed Cohn, and I'm kind of glad because he'd be three, four, five plates ahead of me. But training with, training with Jesse years ago is kind of how everything here started. Um, I came from Columbus, Ohio, training at Westside Barbell, and I saw the team atmosphere there. And I realized how important it was. But that was really not a goal of mine to develop the same team as them. I, I kind of wanted to develop my own team. I went to the gym that Jesse was at at that time. And they had a similar crew. They got a similar style. And we'd do these squat workouts. And I was always hoping his leg would blow out or something. He'd blow out his back, pull a hamstring, anything to try to get one over on. I was just trying to win. I'm not going to win on just being stronger than somebody, so <laughs> I was hoping something really awful would happen to him. It got to a point where he started, like, coaching every rep and every set that I did. He was so highly critical of my hand placement and how I arched into the bar, not arched into the bar, how I rounded over on all my squats. He was highly critical of the foot placement and this and that on every rep, and I was just like, motherfucker, this is driving me crazy. I can't even work out. So what I learned to do is just go like hell. I'd go as fast as I possibly could and hope that nobody saw anything, <laughs> hope that nobody saw a flaw in anything. And that did help me to get faster, which in turn, over a period of time, helped me to get stronger. But during a lot of those workouts, we'd look at each other in between our sets. You know, we're fat power lifters, and we're trying to have short rest intervals, but let's face it, they're not very short, right? <laughs> we would just look at each other, and it's like, when is he going to give up? And it's like, you got to a point where you're like, well, he's not going to give up. And you're like, well, I'm not going to give up. And you're like, when is this going to end? And so that's why we would hope that we, that we would die. <laughs> and you want to try to have people like that. You want to try to have other people around you that are going to push you. With Stan, it was complicated because he came in from bodybuilding and he came in from such a different background. I was like, man, there's going to be a lot of things that we're going to need to work on. I remember the kind of first, one of the first days he squatted at super training. 
he was uh, setting up on a squat, and he kind of had an untraditional stance, an untraditional setup. His head was down, and I was like, I'm going to try to mess with this a little bit because that's not typically the way that we squat. We normally try to get the chest up and try to keep the head in position and all these things, right? So I have him do it for one set, and it's with like five plates, and he's shaking, and it's not looking pretty. And he's like, I don't like that. I don't think that works for me. That's messing up my balance. I was like, well, um, let's have you try to point your feet a little straighter. Might get more tension from your hips when you squat. We tried that. That was a no-go. He came in with a 2070 total. He corrected me. I said 2050 the other day, and he was pretty <laughs> pissed about it. Came in with a 2070 total. He was already gifted. He was already very strong. And it's important as a coach for you to recognize that you're not the end-all, be-all. You're not going to always have advice that immediately works right away from some, for somebody. You have to have the strength and the courage to understand that and understand you might have to dive deep into your well of information to be able to give each person the correct information because each person is going to need their own set of rules for what they're doing. Started looking at his squat and some other ways and started to try to figure out any tweaks we could make and we ended up finding some. We had him squat a little bit wider and right away the strength started to go up. Every time he came in, he was there to learn 100%. He wanted to be, it wasn't just him coming into the gym training, it was him coming into the gym and training alongside me and seeing what we were doing at super training. He was a very, very focused individual and he was, able to, he was able to learn and pick up things very fast. There was one day in the gym where we're squatting with the safety squat bar. He's like, Biggs, I never use this bar. By the way, he calls everybody Biggs, I'll just call him out on this, because he doesn't remember names. It's not because he thinks you're big. So don't get excited. It's because he can't remember your name. Yesterday, I was trying to show him some stuff on Instagram. He's really old. It's like 50-something or whatever. Trying to show him some stuff on Instagram. He didn't kind of understand what was going on. He was pretty confused. Then uh, I said, well, go to my Instagram, and you'll kind of see how it works. He's like, what's your Instagram? He's like, should I? Oh, he's like, there's a button here to follow. Should I maybe do that? Anyway, we're squatting the safety squat bar. I'm like, great, he never squatted with it. I'm like, I can kick his ass on this. So we start going through the movement. He's like, I've never done a box squat before. I'm like, oh, this is great. I'm feeling really good. I'm feeling really strong that day. I'm hopping around with like five plates. Things are feeling good. I'm, I'm willing to throw on my powerlifting gear and knee wraps and whatever, and he's lifting raw in this flex wheeler uh, zebra striped belt that he had at the time that said IFBB Pro all over it. And uh, then I add uh, chains to the, to the bar, or um, bands to the bar, rather. And he's like, I've never done that either. So we got all these things against him. And he's going through his reps and going through his sets, and it's not looking very good. He's kind of moving slow. Well, there's some tricks to the safety squat bar, but normally you don't learn those until you've been training with the bar for a really long time. We get to the next set, which is now five and a half or six plates, he moves it a little better, but still kind of shaking. I have my squat suit on, so boom, I nail mine. We go up another, another plate, adding more and more weight to the bar. I do my set, and I'm like, oh, shit, now it's getting really heavy. My set was really hard. I think I did a double. And he's like, good job, Biggs. <laughs> he, gets under, he gets under the bar and goes down super slow, making all his weird noises that he makes when he's lifting. Hop, chai, hop, chai, hoop, hoop, ska. All those weird noises, right? You guys heard those a hundred times from watching all the videos. He gets down to the box, and he looks like he's launched out of a fucking cannon. He goes, poof! And I'm like, holy shit! And then he goes down again real slow, like an eight-second descent, and comes back up. Bam! He goes over and gives me a fist bump. He's like, Biggs, I figured it out. <laughs> I was like, oh, my God. That's what happens when you try to lift with a rhino. <laughs> Guys, last but not least, the, the greatest lifter of all time, one of the greatest influences in my, in my life, a person that's amazing in the gym and also outside the gym. He's not very tall. He's not here for the vertical diet. <laughs> <laughs> he's more for the horizontal diet that burdick has been working on. The recipe, recipes for the horizontal diet are Reese's.com or something. Is that the website? And any pizza menu. 
There we go. A 901-pound sumo deadlift. I know, sumo's cheating. An 887-pound conventional deadlift. This guy destroyed people in powerlifting. Absolutely destroyed them. He would win his contest by not 100 pounds, not 200 pounds, not 300 pounds. And these were not local competitions. These were world competitions. He beat people by 400 pounds on their total. There's only three lifts. <laughs> I don't even know how that's possible. He beat people by 400 pounds. Unbelievable. He did a lot of these things in a lower weight class, 220 pounds. He broke the all-time world record with an 887-pound deadlift at the, end of a, at the end of a competition where he ended up beating, uh, I think it was Bill Kazmaier's record at the time. Bill Kazmaier, you guys know how big and jacked. Actually, I'm sorry, it was Anthony Clark. Anthony Clark was probably about 380 pounds. Anthony Clark was a 1,000-pound squatter and an amazing bencher. Ed was able to outlift the super heavyweight. So he wasn't only outlifting the people in his weight class, he was outlifting everybody. He had an all-time world record at 220. An unbelievable powerlifting career. It's been around for a very long time. He's seen, not it all, but we're getting there probably. He's seen just about every single thing there is to see. 1,019 squat. People always try to say that he couldn't bench, but he did a 565 touch-and-go bench. In training, he also did, uh, I saw a video of him doing 525 for a double Fish close grip. Use my he would do 405 behind the neck, the behind the neck shoulder press. How many people in here can do that or can ever say that they even would try to attempt anything crazy like that? Pause bench but as strong as he bench. is in the gym, he's a stronger person outside the gym. One of my favorite people of all time, Ed Cohn. <laughs> I go underneath it. Thank you. I think you have your mic up already. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, as I wear my Mark Bell dress today. Um, I'm not quite as uh, verbose, and words don't fly off my tongue as easy as some of these guys. But uh, as far as my background, I'll, I'll start with that, is I was a really little kid. I mean, like, really little. And as a kid, I had no hand-eye coordination. I had to go to the Illinois Institute of Technology with special glasses and horse blinders on and try to learn how to bounce a ball on straight line, in a straight line. So I was a little bit of a special ed kid, Mark. Um, and we were on that short bus together, bud. Pretty much. And that, I think that's what drove me. I was really uh, uh, introspective or selfish, let's say, or uh, I had no confidence. So everything I did was a lot of it was by myself, and I got teased a lot. Not until I actually got into high school that I started opening up a little bit, and at 4'11", 98 pounds, the only course I had was to wrestle because I was too small to play football or anything else. And when I wrestled, it was me and another guy. I didn't have to rely on teamwork or talking to anyone. I just wrestled. And then I was like, you know what? I saw Arnold Schwarzenegger and Pumping Iron on TV like every other meathead in the world. So I tried to be like Arnold. So I'm pumping up, pumping up, and then I met Arnold in person and I was like, shit, I can't be Arnold. <laughs> so I tried to be Franco Colombo because he was the short, strong guy. And I actually went in a couple bodybuilding contests, believe it or not, um, where I have to actually pour gobs and gobs of the tanning stuff on because I'm, you know, a little pale, jacked and pale. Um, and then I saw Bill Kazmaier on TV lift at a, on, on the old uh, ABC Wild World of Sports, they used to have powerlifting on. And I watched Kaz on TV and at 6'3", 330, with very little body fat, especially for those days, I was like, well, wait a second, you could be that strong, that big, not have to diet or wear those little skimpy shorts on stage. I got my sport. <laughs> and it, it just started from there. I, I read Powerlifting USA and Muscle and Fitness, and I just experimented and beat the crap out of myself till I got to where I want. I squatted twice a week, maxed out twice a week, until I got to 500 pounds. 
So that explains my, my style where I round over and I use my back. I had no legs. All I de developed was back strength. And then as I, as I read the magazines, I watched what the other guys did and paid attention and tried it and figured it out. You can watch, you can watch and look at every video or read every article you can, not until you actually try it and figure it out for yourself what that right position is that feels the most comfortable and natural for you will you be able to do it. It'll always feel fucked up if you try to be somebody else. You get that? Everyone is different. You could take us four guys and, so, and even some of the short guys that are my height, take MRIs of our hips and shoulders, and you will see there's slightly different angles of everybody. That explains why Mark and Jesse are here, where Stan is here and opens up and goes like this, where I'm even closer and go tight and, and do it. That explains the difference. We're still squatting. We'll still find a way to get the same thing done, but you'll just be a little different. Mark and I were coaching somebody yesterday, and as we're coaching, he starts talking. I just step back and watch and listen. We're giving the same advice with different cues on how to get the guy to the same spot. So there's always a way to figure out. You'll just all of a sudden say, oh, that's what he meant, and you'll do it. So it takes time. You gotta just keep experiment, 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 and you find a way. I never set out to deadlift 900 pounds, or squat 1,000 pounds, or bench whatever, or to win this world championship, or to get this world record, which at the end of the day, they don't mean fucking anything. They really don't. They don't mean anything. What means a lot is the journey you got to go there. I got some really cool fucking friends, not just here, but across the whole world, that I met through powerlifting. Now I met them through powerlifting, but how did I stay friends with them? Just being a regular guy and being nice. You don't have to be a dick. <laughs> um, so you, you, you get my drift. I just, what, what, someone put up a post, how do you stay motivated? Discipline keeps you motivated. So you're gonna get that routine, you're always gonna go in the gym. As soon as you pick up that weight, you're back home. Why? Because that's what you love. You want to do it, but you want to do it right. And since you love it and you want to do it right, you're going to last a long time, so that's where you leave your ego out. I always knew I could get better, so I just kept hammering away, being smart, trying to get better. As I said before, every training cycle, every single... Oh, cool. <laughs> that's a, yeah, that's a, that sounds like me doing a squat right now. Um, so every exercise I ever did had a purpose. It got me from here to here, step by step by step. Do that four times a year, four different long training cycles. Let's say they're 10 or 12 weeks long, and you get a little bit better on every single exercise year after year. Where are you at the end? Pretty damn good, aren't you? So it adds up really fast. Five years in powerlifting is nothing. It goes by like that. But if you get all these different body parts strong, which is one of the things Stan did from all his bodybuilding days, is he did so much assistance exercise. When he get the power, got the powerlifting, he had all the I's dotted and all the T's crossed already. So he just had to learn better how to powerlift and get strong on the inside, where opposed to looking pretty on the outside. So he had everything in place already. And that's what you, you see the amount of work Mark does nowadays, where he didn't really lose strength, he gained strength and muscle. Look at the stuff Jesse does. I, follow, I watch everything Jesse does with all his athletes because you can never, ever stop learning. You're going to figure out something that looks pretty cool that you might want to try. And that's how you get better. So as long as you can get better, there's a way and there's a will. Understand? When I was young, I never watched my diet. I'd wake up and have frosted flakes. <laughs> what, what I did do is, is, is I tried to make sure I got enough protein and nutrients and then as long as I was in my weight class, I ate whatever I want. But I was young. I could get away with it. Can't get away with it after a certain time. When they, when they say, well, what would you have changed? Mobility and diet. Look at all the stuff on the market today that's fantastic. I tried, if you guys watched his storyline, I tried his bone broth stuff yesterday. Holy crap, was that good. Really good. I tried Mr. Bruce over there, the Quest cookies yesterday. I don't have a big appetite. 15 grams of protein in a, in a fucking cookie. How can you not eat a cookie or two a day? <laughs> it's a cookie. 
You know, so you see what I mean? There's always a way out of it. I started a bunch, I, I've been traveling with Stan, so, and, and I got his number, his number, his number. So I can, I can get in contact and message these guys on questions I have for some of the best stuff in the world that you can't buy. So I have a big advantage. I'll say that right away. I travel with Stan. I've, I've learned so much on watching his stuff with the vertical diet. I do about 80% of it minus a couple handfuls of Fritos now and then. <laughs> and uh, it makes a difference. I walked with Mark yesterday almost 30 straight minutes, something I haven't been able to do because I've had two hip replacements. All this stuff adds up, and it's, and it's perfect. It's perfect. Now, I was two steps behind him because I'm slightly vertically challenged, <laughs> but nonetheless, and just two. And, uh, but it, it, it all works. It's, it's, I used to be afraid to do extra exercise and stuff because I thought it would take away my powerlifting. It doesn't. It adds to it because when you're healthy, you can do anything you want. And that's why we're all here. We're, we're here, what, what he says, is to make a, the world a better place for lifting. It's not, it's, it's, not, it's not about your numbers all the time. It's, it's moving, feeling good, being healthy. If Mark stayed on the same path today, weighing 330 pounds of bloated, disgusting, ugly fat, <laughs> um, there's a good chance that he might not make it to 50 years old. So what does that say about his love for his family? That would have been shit, right? So he changed it, and look what it got him. Because he cared. That's what everyone's here for. We're here to make ourselves better in every way possible. And uh, that's about all I have to say. I'll leave everything up to Mark. Sometimes when you hear Ed, all you can do is this. Because it's so simple that it's complicated in some way. You're just like, yeah. Why not? So, for example, when it comes to bench pressing, what does he do? He's hop on some sort of special machine. Does he use bands and chains and uh, rig things up in a fancy way? Does he try some new weird exercise? May maybe do some of that stuff at some point, but what built him, I've seen his workout so many times on video that I can rattle off you know, almost every workout, but they were almost always the same. What changed about him was the reps, the sets, and the fact that he was always trying to get better. Sometimes the way to get better is to do more weight, but that's not the only way to get better. I think that's our focus, because we see somebody like Larry Wheels pull 900 pounds, or Dan Green, or some of these athletes that are phenomenal athletes, and we get inspired and excited about it, and we're like, that's what we gotta do. We gotta lift more weight. We gotta turn up the music louder, we gotta get more fired up, we need more pre-workout. But those aren't really the things that you need. The things that you need is to understand there's many, many different ways of getting better. You can add reps, you could add sets, and I'm not sure if this was true everywhere, but I'm pretty sure it's true. You will not go to jail, or you, not go to, you will not go to hell if you do the sets and reps with proper form. How many times have you thought to yourself, hmm, I think I should add weight? And what do you do? You add weight, and the next lift is kind of shitty, right? It's not always about adding more weight. What if you just did your five sets of five with the same weight? And what if you just did your five sets of five with perfect execution every single time? It's about practicing it perfectly if you want to last for a long time. Most of what sidelines anybody, no matter how good or bad they are in the sport, is an injury. I mean, you'll talk to, I mean, you know, I was going for a 600-pound bench. Every single time I kept getting hit with a similar injury. Well, if I would have addressed some of the things that were slowing me down, it's a very hard thing to do in life, but you have to slow down when you're going fast. Write that one down because that one's really important. You have to slow down when you're going fast. Life is happening fast. I'm thinking 600, 600, 600. That's going to be so cool. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be like Stan, right? And you're doing all these things to work for it and to work towards it. But you're forgetting the simple fact that if I just stretch, if I paid more attention to my nutrition, if I paid more attention to my sleep, if I worked on my mobility, the 600-pound bench would have happened. 
Everything else was in place for it. I was strong enough for it. I didn't have the mobility for it. Ended up tearing my pec several times over. So sometimes it can be so simple that you don't even really hear the advice because with Ed, when it came to bench pressing, to solve his bench press and to increase his bench press, he utilized close grip bench. To solve his problems in the squat, he used a high bar squat. So he would do his squat workout, he'd follow it up with a high bar squat. When it came to deadlifting, he would use more deadlifting to get better at it. Came to bench, he'd use more bench. When he came to the squat, he'd use more squats. Nothing complicated about it at all. But the other thing that he did is he, he filled in all the other details. And that's what Stan was able to do. And that's why Stan was able to have a career long enough at an older age to where he was able to get to where he wanted to get to. Maybe there's a couple goals that were, that were left on the table, but he broke a bunch of world records and uh, set the powerlifting world on fire and basically created slash invented raw powerlifting, in my opinion. It all started here at Super Training Gym, and it all started with the Rhino. That's how I remember it, anyway. <laughs> anyway, guys, pay attention to the things that are simple, because they can be the things that make you stronger. We had Jessica Smith squatting here the other, uh, yesterday. Jessica's Yay. recently lost weight. A lot of times when we lose weight, we lose strength. She's not only losing weight, but she's getting stronger. How is this happening? Well, she's getting empowered. She's getting excited about these workouts. She's got some great programming going on from Filipino Thunder, Marcus. Some of that information is coming from Ed Cohn. Some of that information is coming from Jesse Burdick. We're trying to get Fat Marcus to mess with the vertical diet. Jessica's using the vertical diet. A lot of us here at Super Training are using the vertical diet. Well, is it because we're friends with Stan? No, we've already pointed out that Stan's a dick. <laughs> We're doing it because it works. I, you know, I was praying that it wasn't going to work, but it did. We're going to do things in this gym that work. And what works is empowering other people. So when Jessica went to do her squats yesterday, she's never squatted over 300 pounds. Yesterday, she squatted 325. How does something like that happen? Well, it's because you got Ed Cohn spotting got me saying the right thing at the right time to her right before she squatted. And I've had these guys right there for some of my lifts as well, where they just say the one thing. It's like the one voice you need to hear. It's the one voice you need to hear just at the right time. And I just told her, you know how to squat. We're all right here for you. Basically like, hey, let it go. Like, it, just, just go for it. You're not going to get hurt. There's no way you're going to get hurt. We're not going to allow that. We're all here spotting. We're all here paying attention. You're gonna, I'm, I'm more confident that you're going to make the lift than you are. And that's the kind of support that you need sometimes, and that's the kind of support that we have here at Super Training Gym. So did Ed do something magical? He had her change her stance a little bit, went a little bit wider with her stance, which I've been trying to encourage for the last two, three years. It got nowhere with. <laughs> but we widened out the stance a little bit, and he just empowered her. He said, let's do it. You can do it. You got to move faster. You got to be more aggressive. Followed instruction and bam, big PR. So why doesn't everybody stand up for a minute? Because I know you guys, your asses are probably I am standing falling up. asleep and stuff. So whoever's next to you, have them, have them grab your ass and massage it a little bit. Get it ready. Your butt's too, sm your butt's too small for my hand. <laughs> <laughs> 